The CN Tower, measuring in at a dizzying 553.33 meters. This structural masterpiece is quite simply the tallest building on the planet, possibly the universe. Not surprisingly, the American Society of Civil Engineers proclaimed it as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. It is a one-of-a-kind marvel of civil engineering. For the 1,537 workers who toiled for 40 months to complete it, it was the experience of a lifetime. Well, it had to be the best <laughs> tower in the world. This thing has got to be a piece of sculpture. It's got to be something that people love in Toronto because they're going to look at it every day of the year. We figured, well, we'll be the highest for 10 years, five years. It's 30 years now and there's nobody, nobody has stopped it yet. Every country has its architectural trademark. For Canadians, the CN Tower epitomizes engineering taken to the height of excellence. forgiven for thinking that the CN Tower was conceived as a spectacular world-class tourist attraction. It sure is now, but the tower was originally designed with one purpose in mind, television. Back in the 60s, Toronto, like many international cities, was going through a building boom. The problem was the new skyscrapers blocked out TV signals. The solution? build a transmission tower that would stand above all other buildings, which meant it was going to be extremely tall. And if you're going to make it that tall, why not? Well, it was a natural thing to think about the tallest tower in the world. In those days, that's what you did. Those were the days. It was just after Expo. People were doing things. Canada was, was in an exciting time. Constructing the world's tallest tower presented just one slight problem. Nothing on this scale had ever been attempted. If you build an airplane or a car, you know, you have history. You have, you have last year's model to look at, and you have lots of testing. We had no precedence here. We were building something that had to work from day one. The first challenge was provided by Mother Nature, wind, a major headache for designers of tall buildings. Before anything was built, models were tested in a wind tunnel. After months of research and refining, they came up with a design that would withstand gusts of more than 300 kilometers an hour. The key element was the shape of the tower. The broad base, tapering up to a slender shaft, creates a low center of gravity. While it allows for some movement, it's not about to topple over. But that's not the only thing holding the tower in place. Using a process called post-tensioning, steel cables are installed right into the concrete. From the foundation all the way up through the shaft, the cables are stretched taut to stiffen the structure. In all, more than 120 kilometers of steel cable are utilized. The tower is one unified rigid object anchored solidly to the base. It's designed to withstand any and all natural phenomena, including wind. The window cleaning crew knows all about wind conditions at the CN Tower. If it's above 15 knots, they simply don't work. I always look down. It's just this thrill of knowing that you're so high up in the air and see everybody down there. 
I always, always look down. It's a habit with me, though. With the design elements in place, the nuts and bolts work begins. February 1973, earth is removed at the base to locate solid bedrock. Although the tower weighs over 100,000 metric tons, the Y-shaped foundation penetrates only six meters into the rock. The shaft of the tower is designed to be one massive block of concrete, which means that it has to be poured in one single operation. As if that isn't enough of a challenge, the shape of the tower changes, tapering as it moves up. A fixed mold won't work. Engineers devise a flexible framework called a slip form. So it would slowly rise and it didn't stop rising. It moved inch by inch all the way up to the top, concrete being poured in. The legs in the meantime were being moved inward as you went up. Hydraulic jacks thrust the slip form ever upward. Average speed, 22.86 centimeters, or nine inches per hour. We had to make sure that this concrete had the right temperature, the right uh, consistency, the right air content. Otherwise, it was rejected. It has to be just perfect. Because if it sets fast, then you fast, then your form cannot move. If it's too watery, then it will fall off the form. It cannot support itself. For 24 hours a day, they continue pouring the concrete. It takes eight months to complete the job. Incidentally, while the CN Tower's shaft is solid concrete, on the inside, it is actually hollow. This is where the water pipes, power lines, and maintenance facilities are kept. Challenge? Balance a seven-story building on a needle, 335 meters above the ground. With two observation decks, two restaurants, service facilities, and the all-important broadcasting equipment, the main pod is the heart of the CN Tower. The framework for the pod consists of more than 600 tons of steel. Wisely, most of the assembly is carried out in a safe place, on the ground. By now, they have to get the whole thing up top. Once again, hydraulic jacks are employed to do the donkey work. Centimeter by centimeter, the 300-ton skeleton inches its way up. Working nonstop, it takes six full days to complete the journey. Once in place, a concrete platform is created to allow room for the iron workers to perform. It may look scary, and it is, but uppermost in everyone's mind is one thing, safety. You're not uh, lollygagging up there thinking about other things, gardening or whatever. You're very, you're, you're very much focused on what you're doing. There's no if, buts, or ands about it. We, uh, we didn't lose a soul. We had, uh, we had it, all, all hands accounted for. We're all said and done. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very, very nice thing, very good thing. Iron workers are a tough bunch. Despite the Canadian winter, they brave on and keep to schedule. Now here's a place not too many people get to see. This is the Radome, and this is where the all-important television and radio transmitters are housed. Remember, this is the reason the tower was built in the first place. What may look like white sheets is actually a tough fabric called Teflon-coated fiberglass membrane. It allows the signals to get through, but keeps inclement weather out. The fabric is held in place by a series of fans that keep it inflated. So it is, in effect, like being inside a giant balloon.
Originally, the CN Tower was supposed to have two observation decks. The upper deck was classic design, panoramic windows with spectacular views. The lower deck, with full exposure to the elements, was a departure for architects. An open deck at this level had never been attempted. For visitors, the sheer thrill of feeling the breeze on your face and hearing the sounds of five million people below is, well, you just have to check it out for yourself. Both decks are very impressive, but Bud Andrews insisted the public would want to go even higher. I said, well, what about getting to the top? We can't. And I said, you can and you will. And don't come back here until you do. <laughs> and they come back a week later, and <clears throat> there we were with this bubble. And so they nicknamed it Bud's Bubble. <laughs> because I said they had to get there. They said they couldn't and I proved them wrong. The addition of Bud's Bubble, AKA the Skypod, meant installing an enclosed elevator to take visitors up another 33 stories. At 447 meters, this is the highest man-made observation platform in the world. March, 1975. All that's left to complete the world's tallest building is the erection of the 102-meter antenna mast. To make certain that it all fits together, a trial run assembly is carried out at the base. The corners have been designed with a V groove to ease the sections into position. Everything fits perfectly. To get the mast topside, a Sikorsky Skycrane helicopter is brought in, nicknamed Olga, this heavy-duty chopper will raise the sections up, one piece at a time. The erection of the mast takes 30 days and 30,000 bolts, there's just one piece left. April 2nd, 1975, a day to remember for the thousands gathered below. It seems as if every Torontonian has come out to witness history in the making. Olka's crew gets the all clear for takeoff. The final piece, six and a half tons, almost 10 meters tall, is on its way. And uh, there was a, actually a little fun with that particular piece because it was a square section all the way up, except for the very bottom, which was pentagonal. So when the helicopter pilots brought it over to drop it into place, they were uh, landing a square peg on a round hole. So I had to explain to Larry uh, Pravichak, who was the uh, backseat pilot, I, I said, Larry, we have a bit of a problem. I said, and I tapped one piece of the antenna. I said, this has to go over here. He said, I've got you. So he picked it up and, and turned the helicopter and dropped the, uh, dropped the piece. And we got some pins and bolts in it. And uh, I told him he could go, and he, he cut loose. And just when you think, how can you top that? A surprise appearance. The show's not over yet. I stood at the top. There are four lightning rods up there. And I held on to one of those, waved to everybody, not being able to see an eye, of course, but knowing they're out there. Uh, I lit the smoke bomb and then uh, got out and headed, uh, headed down for a, a party. With the last piece in place, the ascent of man reaches a new milestone. Build it and they will come. Never was a truer word spoken. June 26, 1976, the CN Tower opens to the public. They come in the thousands and they are mightily impressed. What starts out as a television transmission tower becomes a mecca for visitors from all over the world. By constantly reinventing itself, the CN Tower has maintained its status as one of Canada's leading destinations, attracting approximately two million visitors every year. The CN Tower is the combined effort of many people from many disciplines. 
two separate architectural firms, scores of designers and engineers, and craftsmen from all the trades. 1,537 workers all told played their part in creating Canada's wonder of the world. For each, there is a common legacy, sheer pride. I mean, everybody involved with that CN Tower, that's their tower. Uh, they, everybody believes that they had a great deal to do with it, and of course they did. It was a, it was a marvelous thing for a very large team of people to do. Every time I drive in the garden or into, and I see that thing in the distance, you know, and I, I know the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. It makes me, you know, want to show people, everybody, look, look, I was involved in that project. I am the one which uh, played a little part in that project. I can't help it after all these years. Uh, I see it on TV, and I say, it's my town. You see somebody else who had nothing to do with it, and they still call it my tower, you know. And that's, that's a nice thing, to, to have that kind of pride in, in the community. So it means, I guess, we've been successful. And more than 30 years after it all began, the CN Tower is still head and shoulders above the competition. Over the years, the CN Tower has become an indelible part of Toronto's skyline, almost as if it's been there forever. But the tower has come to symbolize more than just a local landmark. The spectacular fusion of architectural brilliance and engineering creativity has attained iconic status, instantly recognizable around the world. Canada's wonder of the world all began with those who dared to dream, to aim, and to ultimately reach the height of excellence.